And now to the lecture tonight. You will note, I hope, a new initiative asking the lecturer to provide some background reading material as part of the event notice, and I hope that you've all done your homework. Then we'll be presenting on the topic of new frontiers in smart sensor technology for a healthier, safer, and sustainable future. Ben is a fellow of the Society, the fellow of the Academy of Science, a fellow of the Academy of Technology and Engineering, and a string of other organisations. He is director of the University of Sydney Nano Institute and co-director of the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network, which I have the pleasure of chairing. His groundbreaking research in photonics underpins novel applications in telecommunications, quantum technologies and smart sensors. He's received $60 million in research funding, has been an ARC Laureate Fellow and founding director of the ARC Centre of Excellence for ultra-high bandwidth devices for optical systems, QDOS. He has published over 500 journal papers, has been cited over 40,000 times and has an enviable H index of 110. Ben, welcome. <laughs> Great to be here. Um, I'm going to get a selfie because that's the world we're in. So, Susan, you want to be, you want to be with me? Well, how about this? No, 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 no. It's all good. Okay, wonderful to be here. Um, great to see Mary O'Kane, my hero. Um, I wasn't aware that you would be here because you would have featured in my presentation as an absolute pillar of um, what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about smart sensors. Now I know this is a broad audience so I'm going to break it down, I'm going to dive in. Uh, let's see how we go and then we've got Q&A. Um, let's see if this works. Right, so Susan gave a bit of background, a little bit of an explanation but I want to introduce my roles and slowly build up the narrative and bring you into what uh, I think is a really compelling story and a great example of transformational, translational research. So, as Susan said, my day job um, at the moment is Director of Sydney Nano. It's one of the university's flagship, multidisciplinary, mission-directed research institutes. So, um, absolute fantastic opportunity to engage across the entire university, work across science, engineering, medicine, health, law, business, architecture, design and planning. And I'm going to give some examples of uh, some of the research we've done um, in that context. Tonight I'm going to emphasise uh, more some of the research we're doing that's more translational. Um, and in particular I'm going to highlight the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network, uh, which in fact uh, was a vision that Mary O'Kane uh, helped frame back in 2015-ish. I remember being in Mary's office with Justin Gooding and back and forth we were it was a bit of a kind of, you were getting us together and um, I think it's fair to say that a marriage um, worked well and here we are six, seven years later and it's been a fantastic example of a state government funded uh, initiative that has and is bringing together these wonderful universities across New South Wales. You'll see Charles Sturt University um, there as a new member, a regional member. Professor Julian Epp here in the audience is co-director of New South Wales Smart Sensing Network and is the um, head at the UNSW node where we are um, also based. I'm also uh, involved in as a professor research um, and I'm going to give you a, a little bit at the end of a flavour of what we're doing uh, for the Air Force and it's unclassified, it's sensitive stuff, it's important stuff, it's timely stuff. So if I've got time, I'll come back and I'll wrap it up with some examples of research we're doing um, at the University of Sydney uh, with the Air Force. And again, Mary, you played a key role there too. You actually helped that come together. I'll come back to that later. So let me give some big picture um, remarks and set the scene. So this is a busy slide. I'll talk you through it. 
what an amazing time to be um, a university professor working in nanotechnology and smart sensors. Gee whiz, we've seen enormous uh, advances scientifically, technologically, and massive global, national, local shifts in policy and paradigms um, across the sector. Uh, two examples, um, the, well, you know, the Pfizer vaccine is delivered via a lipid nanoparticle that is 100 nanometers. It's engineered by scientists. It took decades to develop. Uh, it's an exquisite example of nanotechnology that is uh, saving millions of lives um, and a great example of what we're doing at the University of Sydney, in fact. And I'll come back to the COVID um, example as a smart sensing case study. In a completely different context, um, computing is just breathtaking. Your phone, if you were to crack it open, don't do it, and pull out the microchip, uh, really don't encourage you to do, the, do that, but come onto the campus of the University of Sydney, find an electron microscope, put the chip under the microscope. The feature size of the gates that do the processing are of order 10 nanometers. So you've got nanotechnology in your phone and that is giving you breathtaking computer power. I'll come back to the reason why that is absolutely vital to smart sensing. Um, we lived through, uh, we're living through climate change. We had last year COP26, um, global, I think, tipping point on um, climate change science, sustainability. Fascinating to think what's happening in Canberra. We've got a state government that absolutely is deeply committed to uh, renewable sustainability, net zero technology. Um, we've got global goals, the UN sustainability goals, um, that are globally endorsed um, priorities for researchers and innovators to align their research. Universities deeply commit to these UN sustainability goals. Universities are reimagining themselves. Uh, we're moving away from old school, traditional, disciplinary focus, uh, teaching to platforms for research, uh, translation, sovereign capability to address some of the grand challenges facing society. Um, an example here from um, a report put together by the GO8 looking at the universities needing to become mission oriented. So that's a, a bit of a paradigm shift that the universities are gonna be bottom up, but they're gonna be mission oriented. They're gonna really uh, position to address those grand challenges. We've got a government who's putting a lot of investment and emphasis on commercialization. Um, we've got a government who is spending a lot of money on defense capability. Just this morning, big announcement, uh, hypersonic missile capabilities are gonna be uh, advanced in Australia. We're gonna have companies, and there's a geopolitical context around that. Um, and we've got a state government, as I've alluded to, that has been for a decade at least, and I think Barry needs to be celebrated for the key role she played in really promoting innovation and translation and getting universities to work together. We've got a premier who talks about um, quantum technology in his uh, speech department. He referred to sensors, he referred to uh, nano. Uh, we've got a state government that's uh, building uh, real strategies around competitive advantage. So really interesting time, and I'm gonna give you hopefully a story that picks up on all of these themes. So this is what I'm gonna cover. Okay, I'm gonna start with what is a smart sensor? Okay, what does it really mean? Um, and I'm going to tease out some of the more subtle concepts. I'm going to introduce photonics because that's the research that underpins. You can't hear me well. Really? Because I've got one of those deeply resonant voices. Is that better? So don't move around. Is that what you're saying? Love it. OK. Very happy with that. Thank you, sir. I'm going to talk briefly about photonics and how photonics is indeed uh, enabling uh, the smart sensors. I'll talk about the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network and I'm going to rush through some interesting case studies. I'll pause and talk about some of the work we did at Sydney Nano on COVID-19 sensors and then I'm going to wrap up with a bit of a perspective on the national security safeguarding agenda going back to the Jericho Smart Sensing Lab. A lot to get through. Hope that I can um, make it clear and simple. So what is a smart sensor? Uh, most of you before I show you the slide, probably rely on them every day. Who's got a Fitbit? Yeah, I see if you, who's got a smartphone? Okay, who drives a car? 
Okay, smart sensors are ubiquitous um, in our world. They play a vital role. <laughs> Probably was triggered by my um, statement. Um, they play a vital role, and they have played a vital role, and they are playing a more and more vital role, and partly because of the advances in technology, the fact that smartphones are so powerful. Um, there's a deeper understanding that smart sensors can address many of the key challenges, as I'll allude to. But simply speaking, a sensor detects changes in energy of a physical phenomenon and converts that measurement into digital data. That's what a sensor is. Um, so it detects heat, sound, radiation, um, biochemical reactions, uh, electricity, um, and of course, we then take that digital data and we analyze the data. We uh, fuse data, I'll talk about sensor fusion. We put sensors in networks. Uh, we use artificial intelligence to make sense of the data. We do lots of data analytics. And again, I'll unpack some of these concepts. So they are a key part of our lives. Um, Fitbits, I love the Fitbit. Um, autonomous vehicles, advanced vehicles, modern vehicles rely on sensors. Smart meters. There's some other kind of pedestrian examples. I'm going to take you to the next level. It's big business. Um, I think the hypothesis of setting up New South Wales Smart Sensing Network was A, it was going to address some of the grand challenges that Mary's office and the government was facing at the time in terms of pollutants in waterways, the air we breathe, security. But it's also big business. We've got a great ecosystem for creating jobs, uh, creating companies, growing prosperity. Um, and again, it comes back to digital technology, right? Yeah, can't help myself. Is that good? We have five billion devices. Um, we have trillions of data traveling around the planet at the speed of light. So it's big business. So let me introduce a concept that is a little subtle in the concept of sensor fusion because when I describe these different examples of smart sensors, it's not just one sensor, but it's a bunch of different sensors. Um, and on this slide, you can see uh, acoustic sensors. So that's listening to sound, uh, radar. I'll come back to radar, it's a sensor, temperature, magnetic field, optical sensors. So sensor fusion is the concept, very simply speaking, that by combining different sensors in a network, um, we can create a more accurate, more complete, more dependable picture of what's happening. Very simple narrative. Um, I could imagine a room like this, and if I had one sensor, I'd have a roughly good idea of what's going on, but not really, but I could load the room with little sensors, listening, looking, and I'd create a more complete picture, a more reliable picture. And when we combine that uh, sense of fusion with intelligence, human intelligence, or what we refer to as the digital cortex, now digital cortex is just a fancy term for artificial intelligence, um, we have what I call situational awareness. And situational awareness is just a nice fancy term that means I understand the situation that I'm in. So there are a number of benefits to sense of fusion. Um, redundancy, very simply speaking, uh, reducing uncertainty, blind spot coverage, I'll give you an example, autonomous tasking, data fusion. So let me make a little bit more concrete because it turns out we are absolutely beautiful examples of sensory fusion. Um, the way the human, and I've had this conversation with colleagues and they've struggled with the idea that we are in fact intelligent, so there's artificial intelligence, but we are actually intelligent. So we are quite capable processing machines. And the way we hear and see, and the way that our brain combines the hearing and the seeing to provide that more complete, more dependable picture is pretty phenomenal. Um, so this is a simple example. Um, seeing um, passes to the visual sensors to identify the source. So that's something you know. You're familiar with driving down the street and you're looking and it might um, become dark. Your, your ears kind of peak up. 
So they're working together very effectively to create that situation. Works both ways, hearing assisted by seeing. So another example, visual focus on a target, um, selective hearing, neurons act to suppress unrelated sound sources, um, and noise reduction. So these are concepts in engineering that we're familiar with, and we use AI to perform these simple tasks, but of course we are in fact intelligent, as I said. Probably the best example of sense of fusion in our world is um, autonomous vehicles. Uh, this is taking off. Elon Musk, um, what did he just buy? 7% of Twitter and worth 100 billion. Um, and in the US, you see these cars driving around California. They're amazing. And essentially, they rely on sense of fusion. So an autonomous uh, vehicle, and in fact, a modern vehicle, even the top of the line um, Honda, I think, but let alone the Mercedes and the BMW, are loaded with sensors. So optical sensors, uh, infrared sensors, acoustic sensors, terahertz sensors, microwave sensors. The whole car is basically wrapped around sensors that are trying to work out how far you're away from the next car. And they use a lot of artificial intelligence to um, uh, act. And generally speaking, they're pretty good. I remember being in Rochester, New York, five years ago, and um, I had seen three car accidents, I think within a day. Um, but the news was one of these autonomous vehicles had, had crashed and um, bumped into a car, and it was a big scandal. And, um, but they're pretty good, actually, pretty good. Probably AI is better than human intelligence. So that's a bit of an intro. Um, let me now talk briefly about photonics. So this is now the science of light. This is the discipline that I have worked on for 25 years. Um, and I guess the narrative here is that photonics is faster, smaller, greener, and smarter. And I think that'll make sense um, as I explain. So what is photonics? Um, of course, we're all familiar with electronics. It goes back um, 50, 100 years, and we know the transistor was invented at Bell Labs. And the transistor is the building block of modern computing. Um, and as I said, the smartphone, literally you have five to 10 billion components um, providing breathtaking computational power. It really is more, more computational power in your smartphone than it's spatial. Photonics is the control and manipulation of photons. The photons are the building blocks of light. We describe light on the one hand as an electromagnetic wave, uh, we also describe it in terms of photons. Um, I typically uh, like to focus on classical um, electromagnetism, electromagnetic wave. So um, I'm not going to talk tonight about the quantum aspects. So um, we call it a wave. We refer to it as an electromagnetic wave. Photonics is a relatively new field. Um, arguably, it is as old as the laser, which was invented in the 1960s. Um, for many years, it was a solution looking for a problem. And of course, um, in the 70s, it was applied to communications. And it is now the backbone of the entire internet. And without photonics and lasers, the world's economy would just completely collapse because you'd have no bandwidth. Um, photonics is a vital part of our ecosystem. It's a vital part of our world. And as I'll show you, it's a vital part of the sensing technology that we're developing. And what's really uh, fascinating is that we are returning to the idea of a chip um, that's shown on the left there. Um, and this is work that um, we've been doing here in Australia for the last 15 years. In fact, Lindsay Botton was part of the KUDOS program that Susan referred to, which was an ARC Centre of Excellence. And in 2003, we set out to establish in Australia a photonic chip, um, a chip that controlled light waves and not electrons. Um, and that is indeed now um, an important part of the technology that we've been applying and the ecosystem and the industry that we work with. So photonic chips are on the one hand vital components to communication, so they are built into optical networks all around the world, providing um, increased bandwidth, um, reducing the energy burden of those communications networks. Uh, photonic chips are being built into microwave communications applications. And I'll give you an example at the end of photonics research in the context of radar technology. Photonics is key to quantum technology. 
So it turns out, that although in Australia you wouldn't get that impression because the high-profile groups here tend to focus on the solid state approach, but um, globally the leading um, companies that are commercialising quantum computing um, in California and in Toronto, um, and in particular PsyQuantum in California, which was started by an Australian, raised 750 million US, um, is based on photonic chip technology for doing quantum computing, not widely known here, so really exciting. And of course, photonics um, is the basis of sensing, and that's what I'll be talking about. And we can use light waves to sense the environment, we can use light waves to sense our blood, we can use light waves to sense, um, and we can do it in an incredibly compact um, device that ultimately should fit into your phone. So I would say the smartphone, the iPhone, where are we up to now? 12? 13? 14? Gee whiz. 15 will have photonics built into it. So this is a little bit of a technical slide, but just to kind of get across the breadth of research in my team um, in sensors. So a lot to go through there, but let me just take you through some of the photonic sensors that we've developed. It turns out um, photonics is the basis of um, spectroscopic analysis um, that can detect a chemical fingerprint of the air we breathe and also is very effective at looking at a particulate count in the air. So we've done a lot of work um, locally with different agencies on air pollution. And the basic idea is fascinating. A laser light literally scatters off these little particles that are, you can't see, but you breathe and they tend to cause a lot of uh, health uh, consequence. Um, and so those air quality sensors are based on lasers. Uh, we do work on next generation LiDAR technology. This is a project with Defence Science Technology Group on a new nano um, detector that um, is enhancing uh, LiDAR for communicating to submarines. So, and you know that's a pretty important topic. Uh, this is a funny example, but it's an interesting story of using sensors to build into a smart skin that we were developing for the Air Force um, to detect impact. Um, and this was part of a project looking at um, one of the acquisition programs for the Air Force on building literally a fabric that would wrap around the fuselage to detect uh, impacts and using sensor fusion and AI. Um, we also do work on acoustic sensors. So these are sensors that um, listen. Uh, this is a sensor the size of my little pointer and um, it has a microphone array. It's a very clever device. So I would put it in a room like this and it, um, it scans the room. 360 does it every 10 milliseconds and it listens and listens and listens and when it hears something it says let me look in the library let me see if I can recognize that sound and um, it looks out and we can program it to recognize babies crying and um, really interesting simple sensor technology that can provide that pattern of life is what they refer to it. Uh, we're working on neuromorphic event-based sensors. I note Clive Baldick is here, he's from Western Sydney University, so we have a great collaboration with WSU. They have uh, really pioneered neuromorphic event-based sensors. These are sensors that look for events, uh, fascinating technology, um, and they are able to see things in space and underwater that normal sensors don't see. And then we have uh, radar technology, and I'll come back at the end of my presentation to an example of uh, photonic radar um, that we're actually using to detect vital signs. So um, let me take it to the next level. So the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network, um, as I alluded to, um, literally started in a room in the MLC Centre back when Mary was Chief Scientist, and it was on the back of some really significant challenges that Mary's office and the New South Wales government was facing at the time across a number of different fronts, uh, the air pollution, which is an ongoing concern, uh, contamination in the waterways around Williamstown, PFOS, PFAS, um, the ageing population, uh, chronic disease, security, um, data explosion, all of these uh, imperatives um, I think motivated what was a fantastic visionary uh, investment in establishing the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network that um, has been um, going for five or six years. And I'm going to give you a few examples of real success stories. Um, and so we are a quite unique uh, and distinct um, 
enterprise and quite new to the ecosystem um, and quite unusual in the Australian context. Um, there are now half a dozen of these sponsored by the state government. They're referred to as innovation networks. They really do emphasise translation rather than the transformational research that usually universities are good at. Translation is simply speaking in a fancy term that says impact. We work with end users, we work with industry. And so we bring together the universities on the right hand side. Uh, most of them, not all of them, those that aren't there should be there. They were there in some cases and we, we kicked them out or we didn't like them, but it's a great team of universities. Um, we work with companies, we spin off some companies, we help companies um, get started. And of course, um, we work with end users, we work with government agencies, we work with Sydney Water, um, we work with Air Force, we work with uh, different um, stakeholders across the entire sector. And the interesting thing and the challenging thing about census is that, in a sense, it's um, as opposed to something like defence or med tech, census is a capability. It's not a vertical, it's not an actual um, government priority, is it? Because we plug into absolutely everything. Um, and in fact, if you break it down, um, smart sensing um, spans across the built environment, um, transport, um, pipe networks, um, the natural environment, ag tech, uh, manufacturing, med tech, resources and energy, space and aviation. So it's a pretty daunting task because we're across that entire breadth of um, the state's um, ecosystem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out some examples. I'll give you a quick example of a big project with Sydney Water utilising smart sensors to uh, solve one of the world's grand challenges around leaking water pipes. Talk briefly about a recent announcement, a um, big project bringing together a bunch of universities to coordinate for the first time in New South Wales and potentially across Australia an air quality monitoring strategy. Um, I'll allude to some of the work we've done uh, relating to um, monitoring animals. It's important stuff. We've got important animals that we need to look after. I'll then jump and talk about Sydney Nano's uh, work on COVID, um, and then I'll end with a brief perspective on the Jericho Smart Sensing Lab. So this is just a snapshot, but I think it really brings to bear um, the kind of narrative. The Sydney Water Project um, is a great one, and I think Julian probably would agree this is the success story of New South Wales Smart Sensing Network so far. Um, it's a relationship that started five years ago. Um, it started with a conversation with Sydney Water that was along the lines of, we've got a real problem. Uh, we're losing a lot of water. Um, and we're kind of like, well, specifically, uh, can you give us a bit more detail? It took about a year and a half to get to um, the point where we could define the problem statement. And I think that speaks to the issue more generally. Uh, we work with these stakeholders, these partners, to help define the, the problem. So the problem, simply speaking, which is fascinating, and this is global, is that they lose between 10 and 15 per cent of the water through leaking pipes. Now, it's a little bit ironic to be having this conversation right now. OK, when this project started, there was no water, OK? Um, but right now that's, uh, the dams are full. But it is an ongoing issue. They lose 10 to 15% of the water through leaking pipes. And it's not just the, the magnitude of the water that's lost that is of concern, it's the catastrophic impact that uh, those leaking pipes have on communities. Um, and of course, we're all familiar with it. We see it in our local streets. And so this brought together um, a consortium of universities and companies to collaborate with Sydney Water and other water utilities. And it was a two-year project, 3.4 million. It says one year, but it went on for a little bit longer. I chaired the board and the steering committee and helped shape the science program and very proud of what we achieved. And we brought together a suite of different sensors, acoustic sensors that listened to leaking pipes. Turns out you can program a computer to hear the sound of a leaking pipe and use artificial intelligence. Um, we use quantum sensors for the first time to map the underground. Quantum sensors detect gravity. And so they actually can detect 
the slight changes of the density of soil around these leaking pipes. Uh, we did a lot of data analytics and um, that project has come to fruition and is worth many tens of millions of dollars to Sydney Water going forward. And I think we've only scratched the surface in terms of implementation. So a great example of, of Team New South Wales. The air quality problem is ongoing. Um, we like to think, and I remember having this conversation with Hugh, and we were outside in his balcony and he looked up at the sky. This was a year and a half ago, I think Susan was there, and he said, I just can't get excited about air quality. I think he said that. I mean, he shouldn't have said that. He's a chief scientist, for God's sake. It's such a beautiful city. We all walk around and we think, what a lovely place to live. The air is just pristine. But the reality is globally, massive impact on lifespan and health and the economy. Life expectancy um, in many parts of the world reduced by, in some cases, of order of a decade. And in Sydney, it actually is hitting the bottom line. Okay, unfortunately, depending on where you live, uh, it is taking, I think, on average, a month of your lifespan, um, and it is impacting um, productivity. And so it is uh, needing to be addressed. Um, and without going into too much detail, because this is an hour presentation in its own right, this is a recent announcement from the New South Wales Department of Planning and Environment um, and the New South Wales Smart Places Acceleration, uh, $2.4 million um, initiative their so-called open air project that's bringing together a number of universities to collaborate to provide, as I mentioned, uh, a really coordinated approach to monitoring um, air quality across New South Wales and providing data ultimately to customers, to consumers. I mean, I think this is all about empowering you. So you know you're in control of your own destiny. Um, and I think this is fantastic. Um, it's taken a while to get there, but I think this is the project that's going to nail the issue um, in New South Wales, or at least get us in the right position to do that. Um, we're also using these sensors to detect um, wildlife, so uh, just a few fun examples. It turns out the same sensors that we're developing for the Air Force for detecting things that are very fast, moving at high altitude, we can repurpose to detect whales. Um, and so that's um, a fantastic project. It turns out when they um, sneeze, when they go up for air and they emit, they create a really fascinating infrared signature that we can see, we can program our computer vision to see that. Uh, we're working with Western Sydney University on neuromorphic acoustic sensors. Neuromorphic is a fancy term for um, using some of the um, brain um, technology, if you like, to enhance the sensitivity of this acoustic sensor, so that's a, a great um, example. And of course, koalas have always been front and centre, and I think we actually really care about our koalas, so we need to know where they are, we need to know how many there are. So let me now pivot a little and talk about a project that was, um, for me, a career highlight. And this is a um, conversation that started in early 2020 when we're all kind of bowled over by this global pandemic. And I started a discussion at the University of Sydney uh, with a great group of academics um, about, well, sensors surely are part of the solution here. Whether it's simply the PCR tests that we're all familiar with, the rat tests that we understand and we're using. I do a rat test myself every three days. I reckon I've spent $1,000 on rat tests in my household um, this year. Um, but more generally, sensors are absolutely key to managing the pandemic and then the endemic that it will evolve to. And so we brought together at the university, I think, uh, 50 academics and had a series of um, great discussions really trying to identify the uh, opportunities for doing um, the translation. So what emerges is interesting because when you look at a sensor and you think about COVID, and infectious disease, you kind of break sensors down into two categories. On the one hand, there are the sensors that do, at a chemical, biological level, detect the virus or detect antibodies or antigens, and we're familiar with those sensors. So there's a lot of great research um, we're doing across the University of Sydney and across the university ecosystem in um, New South Wales and Australia and globally. 
The second part to the conversation, what emerged was that there's another class of sensor that um, detects indirectly the um, signatures of infection by uh, looking for the physiological symptoms of infection. And that sort of refers to the wearables and the other sensors that I've alluded to that might detect, uh, for example, the sound that we make when we cough. It turns out uh, you could program one of those acoustic sensors to recognise the unique signature of someone who has um, the chest uh, infection. So this is just a really interesting perspective. Um, and of course, the sense of fusion that I talked about earlier suggests that, well, maybe you can bring different sensors together and um, monitor a number of different physiological um, attributes, your body temperature, your heart rate, uh, oxygen levels. And it turns out this is a really hard problem. It turns out this is a really difficult problem to solve. Um, and we followed this um, through 2020. Companies were coming out all the time claiming to have a wearable device. And the problem always comes down to the data, the library. You know, how do you train these um, sensors to recognise? And one of the early fails had to do with a wearable that claimed to detect um, COVID infection, but it had been trained on a particular group of people. And so um, it didn't go anywhere because you couldn't generalise that. Um, to cut a long story short, um, we put together a pretty comprehensive roadmap um, for sensor technology COVID. You can read this. Um, it's a pretty simple narrative. Uh, got published in Nature Biotechnology in early 2021. Again, one of the journals that most academics sort of um, think once in a decade, but I was really pleased to lead this really transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary initiative. And just to highlight some of the co-authors, which I think really exemplifies this um, city nano multidisciplinary approach. Alison Tong is from the School of Public Health. Tanya Sorrell leads the Infectious Disease Institute. You often see her on ABC News. Uh, Karine Carlo is medical science, Voitek is in pharmacy. Alistair McEwen is in engineering. David's in biomedical engineering. Alice Motion's in chemistry. June is in chemical engineering. Lemmy is in math. So what a great um, collaboration. So let me get through my last uh, example and then we can have some Q&A and I'll talk about some of the work we're doing um, with the Air Force. And again, Mary, you probably don't remember, but I went to you in about 2015 and I was in the dying days of Kudos, and I said, I've got this kind of plan for a defence project, it's sort of based on what I've seen DARPA do in the US, um, and I reckon it's going to resonate. I'm not sure what to do. And you said, write a white paper. And I think you put me on the spot, and like, I rushed off and went back to my office and pulled my colleague Simon Fleming across the corridor. I said, you've got to put two pages together. Sent you something, and I coined the term ADROIT, Australia's Defence Research and Optical Integration Technology. ADROIT, ADWA, turns out the US has a destroyer, ADWA, Agile. Um, three years later, the Air Force turned up and they'd heard about that and they had formulated their strategy for what is referred to as the fifth generation um, Air Force. Now, fifth generation is the big leap from the um, F-18 to the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. If you were down on Australia Day, you had a fabulous example of the F-35 flying around for 11 minutes. The F-35 is completely stealth. It has the radar signature of this, and it is loaded with sensors. It relies on something like 16 million lines of code to process the data that's generated by those sensors. So, to cut a long story short, the Air Force was looking for a partnership with the university, or they were looking for a partnership with a group that could bring them the capabilities for advanced sensors. And I said, hey, I've got a deal for you. And so in early 2019, we launched what um, is referred to as the Jericho Smart Sensing Lab. And again, that is something I put forward to a group captain in a pub in Chippendale 
in early 2019, and now we have um, an eight-year, seven-year contract, and it's a big contract. And so photos taken uh, back in 2019, and I want to point out the slide on the right. Group Captain Jerome Reed um, on the left there, a uh, fine man. And that Air Commodore Darren Goldie, who was the keynote speaker at the launch, and he's now Air Vice Marshal, so he reports to the Chief of Air Force. So what we're doing, and this is not quite working as I hoped the movie, but let me see if that, how do I make that little animation move? There you go. It's sort of stuff that I'm not going to be able to show you, okay, because it's sort of sensitive, but I want to give you an idea of what we're doing. So it's autonomous air surveillance. Sadly speaking, what's happening in Ukraine right now exemplifies the problem statement. Um, it's about bringing sensors together in an internet of things to provide autonomous surveillance of the airspace up to about 100 kilometres. Um, bringing different sensors together using AI and of course nanotechnology for the Air Force, I don't think they quite get what nano is really, but for them it's about small things. And so it translates to massive reduction in size, weight, power. Size, weight, power. In their language, they call it swap. So the notion that these sensors can be miniaturised to the point where they can be incorporated onto a drone or a CubeSat and have literally thousands of them. So the F-35 is there. And again, uh, this is a published article from Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin, um, pretty successful company, buy stock. Um, they are manufacturing the F-35, so they've sold Australia 75 of these, um, and they're roughly $150 million each. So as the diagram shows, lots of sensors, um, really good situational awareness. So this is the sort of perspective that we have of the battlefield and the 3D battlefield. And it is almost the same kind of narrative as the autonomous vehicle, in a sense, except we have different length scales and different time scales. So we are on the one hand looking across thousands of kilometres, hundreds of kilometres, tens of metres, up to an altitude of 100 kilometres. And we're looking at time scales and speeds that are anywhere from Mark 5. We heard this morning, I think I mentioned um, the Minister talking about manufacturing hypersonic missiles, that's Mark 5. Um, they're moving pretty quickly. And some of the electromagnetic signatures that we're trying to track are moving pretty quickly. So you get the idea of an internet of defence things, of sensors sitting on the ground looking up, sensors up in the sky looking down from a CubeSat, from a drone, from an aeroplane, and uh, bringing that all together to give that situational awareness. So I want to end with one simple example of um, some innovative sensor work. This is published. This is not sponsored by the Air Force, which is why I can talk about it. And so this is work um, from my uh, students supported by the ARC and the US Office of Naval Research. And essentially it's uh, what we call photonic radar, which is a bit of play on words because radar uh, is not photonic, radar is microwave. But we're using photonics to generate an incredibly wide band um, microwave signal. Turns out that gives us enormous um, resolution. Now, to step back and give you a bit of background, you're all familiar with radar because you see it at the airport. We understand the concept of a spitting dish spits out a radio wave, a pulse of uh, microwaves, travels through the air at the speed of light, bounces off an aeroplane, comes back, and from the time of flight, I can work out the distance and I can work out the size of the device, the size of the object, and even the speed of the object. But I can't really see the details. So this is photonic radar. It's so high frequency, we can actually see the propeller blades of a drone from 50 metres spinning around. So I'm to give you some context for why that is interesting for a number of um, partners. So at the same time, we're working to miniaturise um, this to a chip. So the slide image on the right is an actual photonic chip. I don't know if you can see that, but you see a bit of colour, you see a bit of structure. You can see the 50 cent piece. 
So that's the sort of scale of these devices. So you can see why um, the Air Force is kind of interested in this technology. Um, and so finally, we're going to bring all these sensors together. So we can um, bring the acoustic sensors and the optical sensors. So this is work um, that I think I can talk about. But we have acoustic sensors, these little devices that we throw into the field, and they listen. They listen, and they can hear things. Um, but they're not particularly precise, but they can hear things, and they might tell a, a robotic um, camera to look very precisely. So um, that's um, work we're doing at the moment. And actually, the fun story is <laughs> we drive out to IKEA, we park in the car park, and we actually track um, civilian aircraft landing at Sydney Airport, which I'm pretty sure we're allowed to do. Um, another example, um, this is a prototype we built um, last year for Air Force. Um, you can see a little handheld device. So this was designed and built by my team. The idea was to give Air Force operators um, a robust platform they could take into the field. It has two optical cameras that are configured um, with a bit of edge compute, with a dashboard, a bit of a screen, power supply, USB plug, Twitter all built into it. Um, MANTA stands for Mutual Axis Neuromorphic Twin Imaging System. And so these are the neuromorphic um, sensors that I alluded to earlier, the Western Sydney University Group, particularly famous for their um, application of these sensors. It's so fast it can see a bullet flying through the air. So what you're looking at, again, that bottom right graph, is um, out at Richmond um, Army Base where there's a shooting range. And we can actually see this bullet moving through the air at supersonic speeds. Um, now this is probably my last slide. I'm not sure, Lindsay, is the sound going to come through? This, our team is harnessing the interaction between light and sound, called the Brewon effect, in a microchip to provide unique advantages for defence platforms. This compact technology heralds a new era in microwave signal processing as the basis of a frequency agile and reconfigurable microwave system. We've developed prototypes for Lockheed Martin, L3 Harris, US Army Research, DSDG and RAP. And these prototypes show real gains in performance, efficiency, and cost. So that's just a fun little movie. But that was in 2020, the Eureka Prize. And we were in the Messel Theatre, of course, Harry Messel, at a kind of hybrid satellite event. And um, we had the Minister, Melissa Price, announcing uh, that our team had received that national prize, which is fabulous. And I think this is a nice photo, too, bottom left. Um, when we launched the Jericho Lab, and you'll recognise Duncan Iverson, our lovely um, colleague who just stepped down as DVCR and is at the moment sick as a dog with COVID. Um, we've got the Air Vice Marshal Darren Goldie there, and we've got Paul Scully Power, Australia's first astronaut, who um, I get on very well with and see all the time and loves to come along, particularly when the Air Force, because they worship him. So that was fun. I think um, that's it. Thanks very much. Uh, that's my team. Um, and that's out uh, in the front of the Nanoscience Hub. And those are some of the sponsors. But um, really look forward to a bit of a conversation now. Thanks very much. So now we have time for questions. Rachel has a microphone. I can see a hand up. Let's get into it. Thank, Thank you. you. Could you uh, explain a bit more detail about neuromorphic sensors, how they actually operate, uh, etc.? Yeah, so the question is to explain, and I was expecting that, and I didn't want to have to answer it. But the neuromorphic sensor is a fascinating concept. Um, if you think of a normal camera, you kind of have the idea of lots of pixels. And each pixel creates some voltage and generates an image. In a neuromorphic sensor, believe it or not, you build into the, the image chip a little circuit behind each pixel, a little digital or analog electronic circuit underneath each pixel. The circuit does a very simple function. It does a differentiation. Now, everyone who's gone through high school maths remembers what differentiation is. It's the slope of the curve. 
So each of those little circuits is doing, at a pixel level, a differentiation in real time. So it only sees events. That's a simple way of explaining it. And so the uh, technical advance there that's enabled that is the ability to do that electronics at the element level. And that's just CMOS. CMOS is the microelectronics capability that's in the phone that I talked about. We have no problem building um, a circuit that is 50, 10, 20 microns to do that. So that's the differentiation, which is why you see the event. There are amazing sensors. If nothing's happening, you see nothing. But um, if something's happening, you see it incredibly <laughs> well with great dynamic range. Um, and if I acknowledge Greg Cohen at Western Sydney University, again, as I acknowledge, had done some great work looking up, um, tracking space debris, looking down through the water. So you can see things. Yeah, pretty extraordinary. Yeah, there is an acoustic analog. So I think the question is, an event could be an optical event or it could be an acoustic event. And indeed, there is a neuromorphic acoustic sensor, which I did allude to. Same concept, basically. Questions over here, Rachel. Oh, you've got them up. Great. Hi. Um, so you're talking about sensor fusion, and you seem to be focusing mostly, well, entirely on optics or photonics and acoustics. I'm wondering if this can be expanded um, to other kinds of sensors, because sensors are basically receptors of a certain kind. Uh, so I'm thinking in terms of things like olfaction, and you know we have dogs who go around airports sniffing for drugs, and there's this kind of folklore that dogs can smell cancer. So I'm wondering if in the healthcare context you could sort of smell, have sensors for smelling shedding of particular viruses and cancers and things like this, and whether this seems to be a kind of quantum um, process because you're dealing, uh, it's not quantum, nano at least, uh, definitely a yeah. nano yeah, um, kind of um, phenomenon. Yeah. I wonder if there's any yeah. work that's been done on, on this, on expanding the sensors to olfaction kind of sensors. Yeah, look, it's a good question. It's not a topic I'm really an expert on, but your question really is about sensors broadly, and you're alluding to smell of uh, disease, which is actually pretty established, and we know animals can be trained to recognise um, drugs being carried and they can recognise um, disease. They have been demonstrated to be able to detect signatures of COVID infection, in fact, that was in fact covered in that work that I referred to um, as part of that roadmap. I'm very nervous when you use the term quantum because you're opening up then for a whole set of issues to be... But yeah, that's an example. And why not? That would be part of a sense of fusion architecture. I mean, it's all around the use case. But absolutely, interesting perspective. Um, ben, this isn't a question, this is a request. I need you again um, for <laughs> sensing in floods. So uh, maybe talk tomorrow. <laughs> you want to say you just met Mary's doing the flood review. Yeah, you're, well, that's right. So it's Mary's now doing the flood review. Is that the context? Um, so you're still moving and shaking everything around, Mary, aren't you? Yeah. Sloshing. Yeah. Sloshing. 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 So water is a big issue, whether it's floods or mines or leaks um, or quality. It's a huge issue. Comes up all the time, but absolutely happy to have that conversation. Yes? Judith, just wait for the microphone, thanks. I'm interested if, in knowing, and I have no idea, but is there an intersection of the work that you're doing in all these sensors with the issue of rare earths? What materials are being used? What kind of research is being done into the impact of rare earths in this area? And how we can get them back and reuse them, et cetera? Or are we just going down a blind alley? <laughs> It's a bit, yeah, so a good question. It's about rare earths, which are pretty important for um, various sectors of the industry and sovereign capability, and they tend to not be um, easily accessible, and they tend to sit in places of the world where we can't access them. One of the really interesting narratives... I 
I think they are. Yeah, so it depends. So sensor is such a kind of broad term. You've got optical sensors that use lasers. Um, lasers are based on different materials. Um, you make a laser out of erbium or ytterbium, aluminium, gallium, and arsenide, or acoustic sensors, which are MEMS based, which is silicon or silicon nitride. Rare earths show up all over the place. And um, it's not something that we specifically focus on, but I bet you it's there. The interesting point, and I want to make this more generally, and this is a new perspective since COVID, but it's not to do with COVID. It's got to do with the geopolitics of the, the world, but sovereign capability is now really front and center. And that's an example of sovereign capability. So um, we worry about res, um, supply chain resilience. And I, I think it's fascinating to, to reflect on the, the narrative around manufacturing. How long ago was it that we're all pretty comfortable with the notion that we just outsource everything, and we were going to be a service economy. And Kim Carr, God bless him, is just stepping down, you know, as um, a member of parliament, um, was a great champion of manufacturing. And I think we look back at some of the things that he pushed in the car industry, absolutely front and centre now, that we need to have control over critical capabilities, whether it's rare earths, I don't know if it's the car industry, but gee whiz. It's a really important thing. And the folk we talk to in the defence are fixated on this. You don't want to be making a device when your chip is manufactured in Taiwan. So, Ben, I've got a question. You've still got your row of uh, research lab folks up there. What are the topics of the projects that they're working on? Because they're very futuristic. Yeah, so this is my research team, um, and it's a mixture of engineers and scientists. So my research group, so the physics that my group works on, um, and it underpins some of the applications, is we're interested in the interaction between light and sound. That's what we study, that's the physics. So I talked about light, I talked about sound, but it turns out and the physics of this is actually 100 years old, and I'm actually editing a book. I'm writing a book this year, and the title is 100 Years of BS. BS is brilliant. I know, brilliant. It's for short, brilliant scattering. Brilliant in 1922 um, developed the theory of brilliant scattering, which is the notion that light scatters off sound. Um, and in optical fibres, this is a real nuisance. Lights scatters off sound waves. These are sound waves that are induced by the light waves that then scatter the light waves. So we study that interaction at a very fundamental level. And so the researchers in my team are looking at that in circuits. We do that at cryogenic temperatures. And it turns out to be really complicated because the sound waves, the same sound waves that I'm communicating to you at the speed of sound, when you think about a silicon chip, these sound waves propagate at 6,000 metres per second. Um, and it's just exquisite physics. So that's the sort of research that we do. There's a question here. Yep. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, my friend in Lockheed Martin uh, told me a story about the sensor fusion in the F-35 that you referred to. And he says that it's very, when, when you can fuse everything into a spherical picture, it's very disconcerting for the pilot to look downwards and be able to see through his legs and his belly to see the ground below. Have you heard of that problem? Yeah, look, it's fascinating, isn't it? So the idea of a pilot has this helmet, half a million dollar helmet. And so he or she is flying along in this $150 million super fast plane and these sensors create this virtual reality. He or she will look around and will look down below them and will see everything. Isn't that fascinating? And so I think there's an interesting narrative here and this is part of the original Air Force strategy that I referred to, and it was called Plan Jericho. You can Google it. That's why it's called the Jericho Smart Sensing Lab. But it was all about the idea of using AI and sensors to augment human intelligence. But there was a really core principle underpinning that whole strategy was that humans would always make the decisions. Humans always would make the decisions. So the narrative is that already there are loads of sensors all over the battlefield. Um, it's about connecting those sensors in a really sophisticated way 
using the AI to give the commander, the pilot, the information as quickly as possible so they can make the decision, an informed decision. But that pilot has this incredible three-dimensional, well, it's not completely three-dimensional perspective, but I don't know about the kind of what your buddy has said there. I mean, it does sound fascinating, um, but that sense of fusion, yeah. Any more questions? There'll be a quiz later on, <laughs> so multi multiple choice. Robert. Uh, I was fascinated in the uh, use of the sensor technologies uh, with many inputs uh, to sort out the issues of COVID, which clearly excited you, and it excites all of us. Uh, we have a huge problem at the moment. We have no idea how many people in our community uh, ha have COVID, uh, how it's being spread. I mean, is the sensor technology able to access a population like this to give us information for planning? It's a really hard problem. It really is. I mean... It's very hard. Yeah, we've seen... The real problem statement is how do you look at a room like this and in real time know who's infected and, and where is the disease? Because it's aerosol transmission. We know, and it's an interesting story. Um, my good friend Lydia Marwaska, a QUT professor, she's the lady that went to WHO in early 2020 when WHO refused to accept that it was aerosol absolutely fixated on it being fomite's surface and we were told, remember how long it lasted on the surface, all of that's irrelevant, it's all aerosol transmission. So she's an aerosol transmission, she's an aerosol scientist, she studied aerosols for 40 years and she has this very graphic presentation where she explains to you in a room with no ventilation how long these little aerosol particles are coming out from inside us. We're, unfortunately, there's a kind of gross concept, but as we walk around, we create this little bubble of aerosols. We're bathing in each other's aerosols all the time. Um, <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't. But let me, let, me, let me finish. And so the solution, which is um, an obvious one, it's all to do with ventilation. It's all to do with ventilation, and uh, this is why my office window is always open. Um, but one of, the, one of the projects that we are looking at is smart ventilation. So this is the idea that maybe sensors can detect the room we're in, how many people are here, where they're placed, and even their vital signs and know if we're active, how much we're breathing, and can tailor the ventilation. I, I thought you might have looked at, say, sewage or some of the sort of common denominators of an environment which, which has been looked at, and I would have thought that your technology may be extraordinarily helpful in getting more quantitative data out of that. Yeah, I mean, that was done. I mean, we remember that. Um, that was part of the conversation. It's in the roadmap. So I guess the challenge is, and this is what we struggled with, the challenge is that there's 119 different things you can do. How, how do you prioritise? And that's what the paper was, prioritise, prioritising sensors for COVID-19. So it's in there. Yes, you can look at the sewage. You can look um, at antibodies. Um, but I think you know there are some interesting learnings. Like it is, it's about the transmissibility. It's about the aerosols. It's about ventilation. Um, and there's going to be some real innovations. I think in smart buildings, we're going to rethink office, open access, open plan, air conditioning, all of those things. One more question, Ben. Thank you. This is a follow-up. Um, you're going to have a world with lots of sensors, um, so, say in military and civilian areas, uh, and the fact that we're going to be we're coming up to, I think, close to peak solar flare activity, seven year cycle, um, and also in military, um, you have magnetic pulse weapons. So how do, how you have all these sensors? How robust are they against those sorts of uh, threats? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, how robust are the sensors to solar flares, electromagnetic interference more generally? Um, part of the answer has got to do with whether it lies on a digital circuit or an analog circuit. Digital circuits tend to be uh, more sensitive, but it's a little bit outside of my expertise 
to know exactly. I mean, that's a global issue, isn't it, with everything? Um, we do look at, not that it's exactly the issue, putting these into space. So we have um, serious conversations about putting some of these sensors on the CubeSat. There are launches being planned, being coordinated by the state government, and it's the centres involved in various launches. It turns out not to be very expensive, and when you put things into space, you have to worry about radiation hardening. So it, it, sort of having a, a really robust thing for, air, for sensors that are really crucial and that could be impacted by, as I said, other yeah, no, I agree, I, I agree. That's a, that's a topic for another day, but yes, indeed. Good question to end on. Uh, Christy, can I invite you up? Thanks. Do you want to Susan set me quite a task. She rang me and said to me, will you do the thanks? And I said, I know absolutely nothing about this field. Uh, and she said, go ahead. So I first of all want to say that this is the first face-to-face -face meeting, general meeting of our bicentennial year. And I'm really grateful to have you, Ben, talking to us about world-leading research happening here in Sydney. Recently, in, in, when you were talking to science teachers, you talked of your field beginning with the Maxwell equations of 1861. Just remember, our society began in 1821. We're in this new space now. And rather than the situation that we are in, and if you go and see the Nexus exhibition, you'll see those marvelous letters, where really, I think, our society began sending news about this strange new part of the world back to the home country. What you're doing is saying how we here are creating world-breaking research in all sorts of ways, and it's happening here. It's happening in Sydney. So I feel that's really, really exciting. I must say, I did my homework. Um, I spent quite a lot of today, I have a, a friend visiting um, with, this, with your voice talking on YouTube. It is fantastic. If anybody needs to have a bit of a, a lift, listen to Ben talking about his work. He gets so excited. His enthusiasm is extraordinary. Beautiful lithography, exquisite control. He, he keeps us bedazzled, and it's been, it's been a fantastic journey for me to discover more about this field. I think the thing that I particularly learned tonight, which I hadn't heard before, and it's wonderful to have Mary here as well, is, and it is a, a trope that we're all getting very much used to in the university sector, understanding about impact, interdisciplinarity, commercialization, seeing these new spaces. And I thought that that story that we heard, after all, between two of our fellows, was quite marvelous about the way that this NSSN came about and how it's had these impacts and it's really worked in water, in translation. Um, Sensors, you say, plug into absolutely everything. I like that, leaking pipes. I, you know, I, mm, we all have leaking pipes at present, I think. Um, so I think that that's been really exciting. The other issue that I think I'd like to raise is that over the last year in the, in the talks that we've had, we've been thinking quite a lot about the philosophical and ethical issues of new technologies. All new technologies have potential for good and for bad. And obviously, um, data analytics can invade privacy, whether that's public government or private companies. And I, I was very interested in, in your remark about humans making decision in the work that you're doing with defense. And I think perhaps what we need to take from this as a, as a society is that your very lucid description of how these new technologies are gonna work are gonna throw up for us all ethical issues that we have to keep thinking about. And so I think I've found that 
absolutely fascinating and I, I fear I've got a lot more work to do. Now, I, I assume that, that you, we, the president, is now going to present you with a medal. The other president's going to go. No, you, you present with a medal because I've got then to say someone more thing. So it's she very, can't open the yeah. box either. Oh, no. I bet I can. <laughs> it requires a scientist. Yeah. Yeah. Not a physician. Ben, we present you the medal uh, for presenting this lecture, which you can keep amongst all of your others. <laughs> oh, Lindsay. Of course, it's the. It's the Thank you very much. So, really, congratulations. Thank you very much.